everyone. Welcome to my channel. My name is Lisa Allistway. And on this channel, you will find a variety of inspirational and informational videos. So if that sounds good to you and you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. My guest this week is Armand Adabi, who is a renowned contest prep coach, a licensed dietitian, a national physique committee judge, and a former NPC competitor in the bodybuilding super heavyweight division. Among his accomplishments, Armand won his first four shows from the age of 18 to 21 years, including the Lee Priest Classic, Ronnie Coleman Classic, John Sherman Classic, and the Red River Classic. Since 2016, Armand has started his own line of bodybuilding supplements called Abiti Army. Welcome, Armand. Hi there. And my, I know my last name's tricky. It's Adibi. Adibi. I have a tricky last name too. I get Alice Stewie all the time and it's Alice Stewie. Yeah. So I feel you about okay, that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's just kind of get started. Um, with regards to wanting to become a bodybuilder, how and what drove you at such a young age that you're like, yeah, that's what I want to do? Um, I grew up playing soccer at a high level. My uncle played professional for the Iranian national team. My dad played at a top level. Um, and I started at a young age. Um, and at six, 16, we that was my last big tournament, 16, 17. We played over in um, something like a tournament called the uh, Gothia Cup. It's in Germany, Sweden, and Denmark. And then our team, Dallas Texans, represented the U.S. like as the U.S. national team over there in that tournament. So I was, and then that, that was kind of like to dump right into the professional leagues. Because in pro soccer, you usually go pro around 17, 18 years old, young. Um, so that's the direction I was heading. Um, and, you know, my brother played for the same club team, too. He, he was playing there, too, just at a younger age group. And that last year of playing soccer, um, the coach we had, he actually played on the same um, national team for, for, for Iran as my uncle did at the same time. And he was a really tough coach and we were, we were young. So he was really hard to play for, for he was borderline abusive, but we were the best. Um, and that's what worked. And it got to the point where I wasn't having fun anymore with soccer. It was so serious and there was so much pressure just, you know, and then I started having some Oshkin slaughters, my knee, some issues. So I was like, okay, I'm going to take about, I'm going to take a season off. And then, um, you know, just rest and kind of get my mind straight and rehab my knees. And then I'll go back to it because that was my dream since I was young to become a professional soccer player. Um, and everybody knows that's the number one sport in the world and they get paid crazy serious money. So that was my dream. And then I started working out. I was really skinny when I played soccer. I, I already started working out. I was putting on muscle very easily. But, you know, when you play soccer, you're always running. So it, you burn a lot of calories and already had a fast metabolism. And so um, during that break, I wasn't running as much, obviously. So I started to put weight on easily, like good weight, a lot of muscle. So just in that summer, I went from a muscular... 200 and that was really muscular for my height because I was only like five foot seven at that at that age and then I got all the way up to at age 18 240 pounds um so I was just like I, I want to do bodybuilding and then I took we took a family trip to um California and I wanted my parents to take me to Venice Beach I wanted to see at that time I was already reading the muscle magazines just to kind of like get an idea of you know, different tips and workouts because back then there wasn't social media. Like, you know, you can just click on YouTube today and watch videos. We had to wait for the magazines to come out to see our favorite bodybuilders. Um, fortunately, I grew up in Arlington uh, and I, the first gym I joined was a gym called Metroflex. And that's the home gym of eight time Olympia Ronnie Coleman. So when I joined there, um, I went in and the owner, uh, I was talking to him and I was trying to like, just try the gym out and he knew I didn't have money for a membership and so he he gave me a free membership he was like yeah just come in here as long as you work hard because 
he was like, how old are you? I'm like 16. He's like, you look really good. Like you, you compete. I'm like, no, I just, you know, work out. And so I was, you know, I saw Ronnie Coleman as the first person to like, like, so I was working out next to the, you know, the best bodybuilder in the world. So it got kind of spoiled, you know, working out next to that. I knew I could never be that insane. He was just an anomaly, but um, it gave everybody at that gym, gym a lot of drive. But um, just started working out and putting on muscle really easily. And then uh, I had a friend at the gym. I always befriended older guys at the gym because, you know, uh, it's kind of different now. Like on social media and stuff now, you have a lot of young kids following kids you know, their age to get information from or coaching from. And it's just kind of weird because um, they don't have any knowledge. They don't have any experience. When I was young, I always went to the older guys, you know, uh, at least, you know, late thirties, forties to get all the inf like information from. And, and at the gym culture was different at that time. Like, you know, um, the stuff everybody does today, like videotape themselves working out with their tripods and all that stuff. If you did that at like a hardcore gym back in the day, they would they would like break your tripod in half and like bully you and kick you out. So it's just such a different culture today. But um, befriended a lot of them and they said, you should compete. And I was like, I don't like, how do you compete? Like, what do you do? I didn't know anything about it. So, I, I mean, I started studying a lot about, uh, you know, nutrition and just everything that goes into bodybuilding. Started getting ready for my first show at 17. Um but at school, I kept getting kicked out because you couldn't eat in, eat at class, eat in class. So I would just bring my meals and start eating. And you know, I'm sure it's different now where they allow kids to you know do that. But so I kept getting like detention, and then I finally had to go to alternative school because I would just keep getting my meals out because I was determined to you know do this show. So I had to shut it down because my parents were getting pretty upset with me. And then senior year, I started prepping again for my first show, and that's when I did my my first show, not really, not knowing how to pose, going there, not really knowing anything. Um, and I, I won the show, you know, beating people, um, you know, older than me that were on, you know, enhanced. I wasn't enhanced at that time. And so it was like, well, okay, I, I did it. And then it kind of took off from there. I, the next three shows I won and that's, it was, that's pretty rare. And so, especially with I didn't have like a, a, a coach figure at that time. Like most people, the people I was competing against, they had these coaches they hired and all that. Um, my dad wasn't very supportive of my bodybuilding at all. Um, he was, he was or wasn't? Wasn't at all. Wasn't. Um, he was very disappointed. I quit soccer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being from Iran, it was just kind of like a weird thing, just going up on stage and kind of like uh, whatever you want to call it, speedo and getting oiled up and posing. So he wasn't a fan of it. Um, and he was like, oh, this is probably just a phase. And then, you know, he just wasn't a fan of what it took. I mean, he saw me force feeding all the time, eating eight meals a day. He's just like, this is not good for your body and the stuff y'all have to take eventually, even though I wasn't taking anything at that time. And, you know, we just started, that's when we kind of became not as close when I quit soccer, but it's what I enjoyed. And a lot of good stuff happened at a young age for me. Just I got a, I got my first contract at 19, and um, it was it was just an it, and at that time it was a completely different industry than it is today. So you and this was in the 90s, right? The 1990s. This, this was no, this was um, 2002 okay. when I was 18. So yeah, that's when I did my first show, 2002. Okay. That's amazing that you were kind of in the right place, right time to be, you know, living in a town where Ronnie Coleman was training, where you can get that inspiration and that knowledge and that support. Cause it sounded like, you know, a lot of times our, you know, family and friends don't quite understand the, the sport or the passion or why are you doing that? Um, so that's, that's a really interesting journey that you had. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, I never bothered him or anything like that. Ronnie Coleman is funny because we eventually became friends and we ended up doing like a documentary together and all that. But um, he would, all, people would ask him for advice and he would all be, always be like, I don't know anything at all. I just follow what my coach tells me. And he just had such great genetics. Yep. Uh, you know, he's like the only person to ever compete at that pro level and win a show natural at first. And then, of course, he jumped on what it took you know but he was just there will never be another Ronnie Coleman but yeah and then um you know I kind of was 
alone doing a lot of it because a lot of other people, like I said, had these coaches and I was trying to find one, but I didn't meet um, a decent coach until I was about 23. So, so who, who was that coach that you had at 23? I was competing at um, uh, nationals at 23. I was having breakfast and this guy named Dave, Dave Palumbo that I looked up to already. Oh, okay. He was mm -hmm. Top bodybuilder, you know, Dave. Yeah, I've, I watch his YouTube channel. Okay, yeah, yeah. We I do a podcast with him every week too. So yeah, so we so he was like calling me over, waving me over, and I sat down with him. I was like, "Hey, what's up?" And then he was like, "What's your name?" Just start asking me like, you know, what division are you in? I told him, and he's like, "You look crazy. Like, who's your coach?" And I was like, "I don't, I don't have one. I did it all myself." And he's like, "Okay, wow. Well, do you do you want?" He was with Muscular Development at that time, and he was like. Would you like to get interviewed? I'm like, yeah, of course. And so I did that show. And then after that, we linked up and then we did nationals the next year with him as my coach. So he simplified a lot of things. Um, and then my problem was I was over dieting. Since I have a fast metabolism, I was doing cardio. I really didn't need to do. I was, I should have been eating a lot more food. So he made it a lot more simple. And my physique improved a lot just during that short time from you know, age 23 to, I believe, 24. Awesome. Awesome. So what was your training like? How often were you training? Um, at first, of course, when I started, I was overtraining like most kids do, like, you know, training arms and chest every day. And no, I was neglecting my back because, I, you know, you don't see your back. So it's like, and then I, I never got a good feel for it. I had a, my heart, my muscle connection. So, um, and then when I kind of figure it out, I think around age, you know, 19, I had to train a little better. I was pretty much going to the gym and doing an hour weight training a day and um, minimal cardio. But so about an hour a day, five to six days a week. Okay. And um, what was like your, your prep week spot like? The what? The prep weeks. What were they like for you? Um, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. So when I started the dieting, um, like I just saw bodybuilders and I just thought it was just like, cool. You get to look, you know, I was never, a lot of people got into bodybuilding for different reasons. Some people were, a lot of people were bullied. Some people were, you know, wanted to pick up girls or I, mean, I got into it cause I saw, you know, bodybuilders at Venice beach when I went to that trip with my parents and I'm like, that just looks like superhuman. I want to look like that. Um, I had no clue what, what, what went into it at all. And maybe if I had like a mentor at that time, I might've not done it because I had no, I, no clue how difficult and how hard it was on your body and really what went on in, in the whole, uh, in the whole industry. So, um, I was just kind of lost and, but you know, my nutrition, I kind of figured out myself. That's what I went to school for to, to, when I, at 18 dietitian, which really doesn't help with bodybuilding at all it just teaches you basic nutrition you know, you know how to help people with diabetes or cancer and stuff like that um but yeah and um what was the original question sorry oh just like your prep week uh, before the competition what was that like for you uh, getting prepared and and mindset for winning and so forth so I was, as a kid, I was a very aggressive kid. So I was very competitive because I came from that soccer background. Um, and it was different from soccer because in soccer, you know, you have to rely on your teammates. And a lot of times I would get frustrated. My teammates, you know, didn't do well or we didn't have a good game. So, I mean, this was all you, you know, it was up to you to do everything. So it was a really lonely, I remember my first prep, it was just like lonely. You're just doing everything by yourself, especially at that time. I was in high school. All my friends on the weekends were drinking and partying and I would still go out and meet them and I would have my meals with me. And, you know, they respected it. They thought it was cool because like, uh, you know, all my friends were working out way before me, like years. And I started working out with them, and within six months, I already passed them up. So that just showed at the beginning how, you know, good my genetics were for putting on muscle and bodybuilding. But the nutrition, especially the first diet, I mean, I was 240. I wasn't fat, but I was like, you know, puffy, full, that off-season bodybuilder look. And then I dieted down, and I thought I was a lot bigger than I was, and I dieted down all the way to 180. So I did lose some muscle dieting because I did, you know, over-diet, but, you know, I was 
you know, shredded to the bone. The diet was, you know, it was hard. I mean, uh, mentally, people don't think about the mental part of it. Um, just you have a, you're very short tempered just because your body's craving all this, you know, you know, your body's not supposed to look like that or get to that low percentage of body fat. So your body's freaking out. I mean, I remember, you know, I didn't sleep well towards the end. I was just, I mean, I was eating like, you know, I think at that time about five, four to five pounds of fish a day. Um, it was just, my diet still wasn't, you know, on point until I met Dave, but I was pretty much just eating fish and broccoli for every meal. Um, and it was just, uh, it was hard. I, I, you know, I was like, but I was determined to do it and, um, you know, go to that show and just kind of see what, what, like what went on. And, um, uh, I won and I was like, I mean, of course I was really happy. And then and the next show, I believe was not too long after maybe like six months, but just during that six months, my body was just a whole different look just from the six months prior, just cause I gained a little more knowledge and I, got the first one out of the way and then um the second show was ronnie coleman's show and i went to that and won and then um and then at that point i, I was friends with a, a girl named amanda savelle she was about six years older than me um and uh she was already doing professional bodybuilding so she was a lightweight bodybuilder and body bodybuilding at that time lightweight meant women's bodybuilding is kind of like what figure is today so she wasn't overly muscular. She looked really good. And she eventually switched to figure. Um, but she was she had a contract with Diamond Ties Nutrition already. And so we started actually dating. Uh, you know, I was, I think, 20. And she was, no, I was 19 or 20. And she, I think she was 26 or 27. So uh, we started dating. And um, I was living in Arlington at that time. She was all, all the way in, like, out North Dallas and you know, she was, she would help me out. She'd help me buy my food. I mean, I didn't have, I mean, I was working there, but I was still a kid. I didn't have, you know, much money. And so she really put me on the map. And then uh, she was like, hey, hey, let's, let's, let's get you try to hook up with Diamondized Nutrition, bring me some pictures. So I just had my mom take some pictures of me on like a, like a throwaway camera, whatever. I brought them and she showed them to Diamondized and she said they were interested and we, we set up a meeting. And then that's when, uh, they brought me on as an athlete and at that time they didn't have any athletes so as signed athletes so i was the only athlete they had and uh i didn't realize at the time how big a deal it was i mean i was super excited but looking back i didn't realize how huge that was um and they were a great company to work to work with at that time uh i mean I didn't know even what I was like signing. I was just ready to sign whatever because I was excited. They came up with a contract, contract. I mean, it's not like I got an attorney to look over it or anything, but the owners were pretty decent people. And so I saw what they were wanting to pay monthly. And I was like, oh yeah, absolutely. absolutely. That was a lot of money to me at that time. So I signed with them and um, they were a little skeptical. They're of, you know, putting a lot into an athlete before because their previous athlete they had was Craig Titus. Um, if people don't know what, who Craig Titus was, he was a top professional bodybuilder in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, he got a, him and his wife, Kelly Ryan, she was uh, Miss, I believe she won Miss Olympia several times for fitness where they would, that fitness is where they tumble and jump and flip and all that, which was really popular in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, and you know, they, their story was they, you know, he kind of got off on the wrong road. He was always kind of hot tempered anyways. And they had an assistant living with them named Melissa James and something happened. And next thing they know, they, she was dead. They put her in the trunk of the car, drove her out to the desert in, in Vegas and burned the car with her in the trunk. And so um then they went on the run it was a crazy deal because everybody knew craig was you know kind of like not a good guy but no one expected anything like this um you know i think what happened was the story was kind of like they were all partying really into recreational drugs i think this was like craig's story but you know he they, they handled it the wrong way i think he was uh you know injecting her with some sort of you know dope or whatever and she OD'd and passed away 
Some said, you know, they were having a, you know, affair. Some said they were all in, it, in on it together. So no one really knows. But um, when they got caught up, uh, you know, he took full blame for it. So his wife, because Kelly Ryan, before she met Craig Titus, was known as like just a very sweet, just everybody loved her. No one had any sense, anything bad to say about her when she met Craig she kind of started changing and Craig was a very bad influence on her. She got into, you know, recreational drugs and, you know, um, and then, yeah, so he's pretty much in there for a lot. I mean, he just had a parole, like a parole meeting, but he's going to be in there probably until he's a really old man, but she just paroled out, uh, I believe like three, several years ago. But since she's been out, no one's heard from her. Um, I mean, Wow. And then, so that's what, that was their athletes. So signing me, they were kind of like, you know, they had a bad taste mm -hmm. in their mouth for an athlete. And, and uh, so after a while, they saw how dedicated I was and, you know, how driven I was. And so it worked out. I was with them for about four years and I made a, one of the worst decisions I made was leaving them and going to another company called Muscle Tech, um, where I was just a, was one of many bodybuilders muscle tech they were the one of the most popular supplement supplement companies in the 90s and early 2000s i mean i grew up looking at all the my favorite bodybuilders sponsored by muscle tech so my dream one day was to become a muscle tech athlete but that was the worst decision to leave dometize and go to them they were paying a little more at the time but when i signed up for them when i you know uh, signed a contract with them I just didn't feel as important. I mean, you're, you know, in contracts with, you know, they had about, I think, 30, 40 people in, in the industry, all the top people signed. So, you know, the first couple of years, it was cool. I mean, they, they took care of you and, you know, paid for everything and, you know, paid well, but I still like, I messed up. I, I was the only one at Diamond Titus. I mean, um, at the booths for the Arnold and the Olympia, I, I was used to working them and, you know, being out of booth with like, and Diamond Ties would spend a lot of money. They had a lot of money, that company, to have one of the best booths at the Arnold and Olympia. I mean, so I was at the booth and there would be banners from the convention center hanging like all of me just around the booth. And <laughs> I just thought it was just so normal because it, it, it wasn't like it came to me easy because I yeah. worked really hard for it, but sure. it just all came. So I thought like it was just always going to be that not easy, but I, I, let's say I, I'm going to work hard and I'm, I'm going to, you know, it's going to uh, be rewarded well. And then mm -hmm. I was with muscle tech and it, I found out like I made a bad decision. And, uh, and then at, eventually muscle tech dropped pretty much all their athletes at once because mm -hmm. they were known as, you know, the, uh, like the best marketing out there, but their supplements were, were not that great. And mm -hmm. so once everybody kind of got dropped from them, a lot of people stopped competing and retired because they just couldn't afford to, to compete. Um, and so that was probably one of my biggest regrets in bodybuilding. I should have stayed with Diamondize and kept building with that company. But, that that know, brings up an interesting point when, you know, people always like to compare eras, which was the best eras, you know, which had the advantages, the pros, the cons. Do you like the era that you grew up in and the things that came with it? Or do you think, today's era is better worse what are your thoughts well you know in the 90s they had joe weeder joe weeder was probably the most passionate him and his and his brother ben they were giving out contracts like you know all these bodybuilders that were competing in the 90s they were able to compete because they gave out such amazing contracts i mean like really great paying contracts you know, at least at that time, you know, everybody's contract was at least over $200,000, which is a lot for bodybuilding. Um, and so everybody was taken care of. Once they started getting a lot older and then they, I forgot what year, you know, they passed away, but bodybuilding kind of changed after that. There wasn't these huge contracts like you could be signed with anymore. So I think probably the 90s era that had it the best like financially financial wise and the physiques were amazing at that time so I, I came in like right after that so i 
I looked up to those guys and their work ethic and all that. And today, you know, it's, I get it because the guys today aren't making money at all. I mean, like the top three might make money, but the rest are struggling and they're not, it's just, it's sad because I'm, all the things I got to do, like travel, you know, around everywhere, go guest post, do seminars, you know, Mm -hmm. They used to fly first class everywhere. I haven't picked us up in limos, best hotels. Like they don't do any of that stuff anymore. So it was, um, you know, and that's the, when I retired, that was one of the reasons I retired. There was a lot of different reasons I retired early because I could have kept going, but I retired early just because I was so fed up with a lot of different things in the industry. But no, today, these guys, I feel sorry for them because they do not have it good at all. Um, I mean, unless you're Chris Bumstead or something. Yeah, you know, you either got Mr. Olympia, Rami. I mean, uh, there was Rami, and then now it's Hottie. Yeah. And then Chris, and then um, maybe a couple others, and that's about it. Yeah. And the rest of them are not making money. Yeah, so you said you were getting fed up with the industry. Can you um, expand on that? So, you know, it's subjective. When you're on stage, you get judged. It's subjective. Um, and so I get it. And then, you know, everybody knew you had to pay your dues. So once you got on the national stage, you know, nobody was expected to win, even if they deserved to win their first national show out there. They, the judges really made you pay your dues and, you know, see if you're going to come back, how strong you were, because they wanted to create a, like a good athlete and professional that just didn't give up. But, you know, the, the first, um, I think I, I, I didn't have anybody really explaining to me at that time. And, and it was hard because, like I said, there was no social media. We didn't know, like, who was who. Um, you didn't, like, even my state chairman, I didn't even know who that was. Like, he, made, he came up to me after I competed at the Nationals at, when I was 24 with Dave. And I was really upset because I got third place and I should have won. I had something called gyno. It's like a little like um, gland swelling under my nipple. Um, most of the time it happens from testosterone converting to estrogen. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the case for me. I was taking a, uh, something called Advodart. It's kind of like Propecia for hair loss because I was, my hair started thinning a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so towards the end of the show my nipples got really like swollen and they looked bad so after the show our state chairman came up to me and he was I was like really fed up at that time and he came up to me he was like hey why don't you tell me you're doing the show and by the way he was dressed and everything I was like I was like who the f are you like in a rude way he goes um you're state chairman and I'm like oh, okay sorry I'm like why didn't I win because he was the head judge I'm like why didn't I win he was like, well, you had your, you know, you know, gyno. And I'm like, so I got placed down two spots just because of that, because, you know, I was a clear winner. Everybody told me, not just, you know, my family, everybody mm -hmm. from top coaches to other people when I got off stage. And he's like, no, you you know, just because you're gyno, you, because that shows signs of, you know, drug abuse and we count off for that. I was just like, whatever. But, and that's, so that's kind of where I learned that you had to start, to get forward, you had to start like kissing up to people and, you know, playing the, playing the game. And I, I was, I don't know if I was just, I don't know if I would call it immature or just, I wasn't going to do that. Um, I was like, I'm good enough that I can, you know, do this without playing the uh, politics and kissing up to people. That just wasn't my personality. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then, you know, it got, I think when I was 25, you know, of course, bodybuilding. Um, of course, you have a lot of gay fans, obviously. Um, and I had it. That's something I had to get used to because I wasn't around many gay people in high school. I mean, it wasn't like it is today where it's everybody's out and it's accepted. And so I had no clue like that's who so many fans were going to be. So I had to get used to that, which was fine. But then when I was getting ready for the, um, I was 25, I was getting ready for the North Americans. And I remember that year, Sean Roden, which was going into that show, which was, he won the Olympia. 
um, and two, uh, several years ago, but he passed away. But he, um, so I was going into that show. Dave was helping me. I looked really, really good. Um, a few weeks before the show, I got a email from a guy. I used to get at that time. It was, it was kind of different. You so you had a your contract with you know um, the nutrition company you were with, and at that time I started shooting with the magazines, but I I didn't have a contract with the magazine at that time yet. So I was just shooting with them, and and then you had um, you know these different websites like mostmuscular.com. The owner was Joe Labelle. He started doing DVD DVDs of us when we were eighteen. So and he would pay us, and he really helped us a lot to build a huge fan base. Me and my two other friends that grew up bodybuilding together. Um, so I didn't really realize that I had all these fans, and it was really weird and shocking. I was like, "That's really cool that all these people know me." And so he's like, "You need to start making your DVDs." And I made four DVDs eventually, just not even talking, just working out. They were boring. I'm like, "Who who who'd want to buy these?" And um, you know, Jay Cutler used to sell his DVDs for sixty dollars, and so uh, my friends that they sold their DVDs for twenty. They're like, "What are you going to sell yours for?" I was like, "I think 60 They're like, "That's too much." I'm like, "If it's too much, it's too much. They won't sell." And I'll just put it sixty, and they sold like crazy. I couldn't even hardly keep up with them, uh, and it was um, there was just so many different avenues to make money at that time. Mm -hmm. And if you if you were a hard worker. And so going back to that show, uh, I got an email and he was like, hey, I'm a huge fan of yours. That was kind of normal because a lot of times when you started prepping for a show, your fans, like people you didn't even know would be like, they would send you money. So you had all your, per like your fan sponsors too, that would just personal sponsor that would just send you money when they knew you were prepping for a show. Like, you know, some people would send a few hundred a month, some would send a few thousand. So, I mean, you were, at that time, it was it was pretty much making more money than all the legit, um, like the supplement contract plus the DVD sales. It was just amazing, mm -hmm. like how all these fans would just send you money just because they were a fan. Mm -hmm. So I thought this was just another fan thing. He was like, hey, you know, big fan. I'm going to be at the North Americans. Would you be cool with hanging out? I was like, yeah, sure. You know, a lot of that was pretty normal to meet up with fans and, you know, go to dinner and they would usually, you know, take care of you, pay you to meet you and all that. And Cause they knew if bodybuilding was hard and we spent a lot of money, of course, you know, on everything that it goes into bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, yeah, sure. What, what, like, what do you have in mind? What do you want to do? He goes, well, um, you know, I don't mean to offend you, but are you cool with like, kissing and cuddling and i'm like <laughs> um i've been asked crazy stuff before but i was just like no that's not a, no i'm not cool with that it's not gonna work that, um, isn't that somewhat the underground of bodybuilding especially on the female side them wanting to do wrestling and stuff like that well the females unfortunately that was like kind of like their own only only fans <laughs> avenue avenue for money because yeah. the female bodybuilders wasn't very popular with yeah anybody else so you would have these usually guys they kind of all felt the same mold the guys were usually about 150 or less pounds really tiny guys and they like to be dominated by women yeah the gay guy part of it they would just want to just maybe hire us to you know watch us pose for a few minutes so let's say you're at nationals you had fans there and they wanted to meet you and watch you pose. I didn't see anything wrong with it. It wasn't anything inappropriate. And so you could pose and make, you know, $20,000. At least each person would maybe pay a thousand, two thousand. Um, but I was also popular at that time. So it wasn't like anybody, but body, body, bodybuilder could just do this. Mm -hmm. So I just told him decline. And I was like, you know, just whatever. And he goes, that's cool. I understand. Um, and I, you know, appreciate it, whatever. But he goes, I'll see you at the North Americans. I'll be judging your show. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, gosh. And mm -hmm. so I knew that wasn't good. And um, because that time I already heard of a lot of people doing, you know, trading out sexual favors for placings and, you know, paying for placings and pro cards and all that. So I went into the show and 
I was on point. I looked great. And I ended up placing, I think, like eighth place. And I was crushed. I mean, I should have placed probably first or second. I should have either beat Sean Roden or got a second at the worst. Mm -hmm. And I was just really just heartbroken after that show. And, uh, you know, Dave was trying to calm me down. And he was like, yeah, that was bad. That was bad. Mm -hmm. He goes, all you can do is just keep going. And that's where, you know, the judging just started really to wear on me. I was so tired of these judges. At that time, they're mostly really older, frail men. I'm like, what do they know about, you know, it's just. And so I didn't play the politics of going to the judges after the shows. Hey, what do I need to work on? They liked all that stuff. What do I need to work? I already knew what I need to work on in my physique mm -hmm. and getting like, you know, silly little answers from them. So I just didn't talk to them. And. You know, I'm sure that created some tension because all the other athletes pretty much were talking to the judges, were emailing them, were asking for advice. Mm -hmm. And I was just kind of, um, you know, I was just kind of had a, still, I had that mindset, like, I'm just going to be so good that I'm going to come in here and they can't deny me just because I'm going to look way better than anybody else. And, you know, um, but I mean, I'm, I'm glad I didn't get that because I, why would I want to get my pro card? Because I kissed and cuddled with a 70 year old man or that, whatever. <laughs> so and that's so, so unethical and immoral. And, you know, you, like, where are the standards? Where's, where's the, uh, the rights of the competitors? Where, when did there's, when did they go in and clean that up? Or is this still going on? It never really got cleaned up. Um, you know, what happened was when the money started leaving bodybuilding around 2011, 12, 12, 13, that's when the magazines, that's when print started dying. So that's when our contracts went away because the magazines went away. You know, mm -hmm. everything was switching to digital and all these magazines, they, they didn't know what to do. They were panicking too. They were like, Let's start just posting stuff online. How are you going to, you know, post something online? Someone's just going to steal that content and post it everywhere. So it wasn't like, you know, for magazine subscription, because they were trying to sell like, sell like online magazines at that time. And all someone would do would buy, you know, buy one online and share it all over the internet. So nobody's, and so when that happened, that took a big chunk of the money out and like the legitimacy of making it in the magazine. You weren't just going to, making in the magazines it, unless you were really good mm -hmm. and so that kind of like showed that you were um legit when you made it in the magazine today you know it's such it's so wild it's just social media anybody can just be somebody and they could you know photoshop um, <laughs> yeah just someone that they're not and uh, that took a hard time to get used to seeing that transition and then the bodybuilders that came in after that transition, they were all gun ho and happy because they didn't get to experience how good it was. And, and when all the changes happened, especially when, especially when Instagram came in um, and literally, cause I started coaching people at 18 just for fun, like my friends and all that. And I didn't, I didn't even think of being a coach. And so all my friends were doing good and winning their shows and all of them were like, why don't you do this for a living? You have a good niche for it. You're really good at this. And so at age 20, that's where I started doing as a living too. Along, even though I was making money from bodybuilding and I could have just lived off that, I was, I wasn't the lazy type. So I always had to feel like I was working or I'd feel like a bum. A lot of bodybuilders, they would just live off their contract and just eat, sleep and train because I mean ideally that's the best way to put on muscle is rest just sleep as much as possible eat and train but I just I never could just sit, sit still so I was always working at least a few jobs um so yeah at that time that really discouraged me after that show I took the whole next year off just to put size on came back and um uh, at age at, 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 I was 25 then I came back at age 27 um did a show that year, uh, I think the Sacramento, and I hired a new coach at that time. So me and Dave at that point, we were really close friends. And so every time it was time for check-ins or everything, he was just like, yeah, you look amazing. You look amazing. 
I needed a coach, so someone like like my ex soccer coach, someone really telling me, you know, you're not good enough. You, you know, you need to work on this. Being way more critical of me because that's what I needed, and that's what I was, you know, used to and responded better to. Because Dave was like, "Yeah, man, you, you know, you look like a freak. You look awesome. You're eventually going to do well." Like. I needed to tell, I needed someone else to tell me. So I found a coach at that time. His name was Tony Rombot. <laughs> and of course he coaches Chris Bumstead now and Hottie Chupon. And he was Derek. the coach of Phil Heath and Derek and all that. Mm-hmm. But Hani, Hani would only work with you if you, if he thought he could make you like a top 10 in the bodybuilder in the world. If you, so you already had to be good. So he wasn't the type of person that take a client from here to there, he would already, he would only take you if you're already really good. So one of my friends was working with him already. That was good. And then, um, I got introduced to him. And so I hired him and, um, he was a lot different than Dave. He had a lot of different ideas and was just on me way harder. And so I competed with, I put on a lot of size, uh, well, not a lot. I, my physique changed a lot once I got with him. So competed at age 27. I took off at age 28 the whole year just to put on more size under his guidance, honey. Um, and I think that was the year I was eating the most food. I was eating like 10 full meals a day, which was, um, it was. How, how many calories was that? I don't even know. <laughs> I mean. Each meal would be about eight to 10 ounces of meat, of beef, whether, or whether it be uh, meat, whether it be fish, chicken, turkey, beef, and about, you know, a cup to two cups of rice each mm-hmm. meal. And uh, that's what it took. I needed to do that off season. Mm-hmm. But then also what I've always did before was starting at age 24, I got, um, I, I would do my bodybuilding show. I would come off the, whatever you want to call them, super supplements, gear, steroids, whatever. After the show, I would get smaller. I would go to to New York and I would do modeling stuff. Not any bodybuilding stuff. It was just strictly just modeling stuff. And uh, those photo shoots paid a lot more than the bodybuilding ones. So they would put them in like, um, like coffee books was, I guess, a thing popular in Europe. So they could sell pictures to them for a lot. And then I started like um, auditioning for stuff too when I would go up there. And then at age 25 also, I went, I'm kind of backtracking a little bit, but they invited me to, to New York to come stay at the, at the model's house. It was a house just um, full of, it had about eight models living there, but it wasn't fun living conditions. Each room was two twin beds with two guys in each room. Basically, it was just a house for us to stay at and go do auditions, come back, go out, do auditions and come back. So I had no acting lessons. I was never in drama when I was in school or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I didn't have experience in acting or at all, but you know, they would set you up with auditions. You would go to them. I mean, these auditions, they're, they'd be hosted several days. And I mean, 500,000 people would show up for these things. And so it's like, how am I going to get picked out of all these people? and Um, so go ahead oh no go ahead so one uh commercial I was trying out for I made it to like the last call up like the last call like uh I think it was the fifth callback so I was really excited I mean I really thought I was going to get this part um because it was a bodybuilder role and the other guys I was going against I I thought I looked way better than them, but, and I didn't get it. And so a photographer, I was, it was one of my favorite photographers at the time named Rick Day in New York. Um, I was talking to him. I was all bummed out. He's like, Armand, you know how things work, right? And he was like, how? And he's like, well, you have to sleep with the, the get most of the guys, well, not most, all the guys on the cast and crew was gay. And he's like, you got to sleep your way to the top. And I was like, no. I was like, I was just like, no. And um, like a Hollywood I was just casting scared. couch. Yeah, and that's all. All that all that stuff's true. And 
I was discouraged. Then I was in, I was living in, in New York at the time about six months. And then um, I, did, I got out of the model's house because one of my fans, he lived in uh, off 76th and Broadway. He had a really nice apartment. He said, hey, you can live with me. Just we got rules. No girls over. Because he had a lot of, you know, nice antiques in his house and all that. And he was really in, he had a really big apartment too. Um, and so I lived with him for like the last, I think, two months. And eventually I just, I was homesick. I, I was really close with my mom. I missed her. And I was just, I didn't like New York. Yeah, burnout. And I was like, yeah. I'm not going to make it because I'm not going to do what these other people are doing to get ahead. Yeah. So went back and but I did get a lot of good photo shoots out of it and you know like I remember one photo was like in 20 different publications so you know I, I got to learn like how it was and just how everything worked and uh, but I was just still you know when you have to hear stuff like that you kind of know what has, what goes on but just to hear like if you actually wanted to make it you would have to do this stuff so mm. That's so, you know, kind of disheartening that, you know, people with the power are corrupt, you know, and will use that, um, you know, to, to their own gain. But uh, hopefully with you talking about it and raising awareness around it, like people, you know, can, uh, can do something about, you know, that not happening as much. Yeah. And, you know, they, it cleaned up in bodybuilding a lot, like I said, because when, you know, all the money left out of bodybuilding. Yeah the pro card lost its value. Um, yeah. And then plus, you know, they used to give like 10 pro cards out a year. And now I think they give about a thousand out a year, which I mean, they're, they're they've added a lot of new categories. So yeah. right, rightfully so, but you know, a pro card meant at that time when you got a pro card, it meant that you could go to the pro stage and compete. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was with muscle tech, they sent me down with a couple other people. I didn't even know who they were, but, it was a meeting about getting my pro card. And they're like, if you really want to get your pro card this year, you like we can, and we could get you pushed through because muscle tech, you know, they sponsored literally all the big shows. Mm -hmm. So they put all the money up. So if I look good and I wanted to turn pro, I mean, I, they're the ones that's paying everything for So I could have turned pro. This was at a, like age, I think, um, maybe around 25 also, but I was like, no, I'd rather wait, you know, and get it at the right time when I'm a little bigger and I could go straight to the pro stage because I don't want to get a pro card and have to sit out two years just to put on the extra size then to come back. So mm -hmm. maybe that was a mistake. I don't know, but I, so I basically turned it down, mm -hmm. but at that time, the amateurs, some of us amateurs were, way more popular than the pros so people think like oh you're a professional and making more no like at that time so many so, so many of the amateurs were way more popular and making a lot more money than the professionals at that point so yeah so that's what I did and then uh, um, I think my next show was at age 29 and that was nationals again with Bonnie and that's a whole that show was uh, a whole nother crazy story went into that do you want to give me the the cliff notes yeah basically getting ready for the show best i ever looked that's the year that i shot with ronnie with netflix it was on net it was for the discovery channel and they put on netflix too it was a documentary on bodybuilding um i had a lot of footage in it so it, it when it went on netflix you know it was crazy how much attention you caught i mean it's netflix so um, I was prepping for the nationals. I was dating this girl at the time. My, my downfall was always hanging around, not the best <laughs> women. And so I was just drawn to just kind of like craziness, I guess. But um, I was hanging out with this girl, was leaving her with her at the time. And I just, I, I wanted to move back with my parents towards um, the last few weeks before nationals, just so my head was on, on straight and all that. So she was over at my parents' house and, and her, her and her sister were like in this feud with each other, making fake profiles of each other. Her sister was making fake profiles of me. I was like, I thought it was so juvenile. I, I wasn't worried about that. I was worried about nationals. Like this was going to be the, this was supposed to be the show that I was going to get my pro card at. And I was going in 
um, that everybody knew like, hey, he's a runner to get his pro card at the show. So I took, the, this was probably the most serious I took a show ever. And, you know, she was making fake profiles of her sister. And so I kind of blocked her and broke up with her. And she was emailing me. She's like, hey, destroy your computer. My sister called the police or tracking the IP address for fake profiles. I'm like, like, what? I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Whatever. I just ignored it. And a week and a half later, I'm, I'm, at my, I'm in Boxer Breeze cooking fish in my parents' house and about 15 cops kicked the door down. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and so um, I have no clue what's going on. Guns drawn, head, you know, face down, hands behind your back. My brother was home. Luckily, my, I, I, I'm thankful my parents were not home at that time. And so I had no clue what was going on. Finally, they told me they were there for a new law called internet impersonation. Basically, this, this law just passed like three months prior. And come to find out, I was the first person getting arrested. For, I didn't get arrested at that time. They let out a warrant like almost a year later. But basically, it's just making a profile of somebody and, you know, a fake profile and giving out false information which I had nothing to do with. I was just caught in the middle because it was done on my computer yeah. and they traced the IP address back to my computer. Wow. And wow. so, uh, I mean, you know, of course they found, you know, my bodybuilding special supplements and all that in there. And um, they searched my house for about three hours and, you know, let me go. I didn't say a word to them. I'm not dumb. I'm, I knew not to talk to detectives and cops. So they didn't arrest me or anything like that. They said they were going to investigate it more or whatever. And then so uh, they took every single electronic out of the house, phones, computers. And I was really upset because they took my, my mom's computer and all that. And so it was, that was wild. Rough. And so I was going in that, into that show and I was like, okay, like, I'm not going to tell anybody this happened because the last thing I want is the judges finding out. Right. Mm -hmm. So my posing coach at that time, she, she knew something was really wrong that day. I was, you know, that was really stressful. This is like two and a half weeks out from the show. She's like, what's going on? What's wrong, Armand? Talk to you. I'm like, I'm, I'm good. She's like, no, you're not good. Like, what's up? And I told her what happened. And, and I was like, do not tell anybody. She's like, I promise I won't. And she was a lot older than me. So I thought I could trust her. Get to the show. Everything's great. Night before the show, I'm, me, Phil Heath, Hani, and Lee Thompson are on the rooftop posing. They're like, you got this. Like, you look so insane. Next day, pre-judging, I get like third call out, which means you're not going to place the top five. Mm -hmm. And I'm just looking at the judges table and Lee Thompson's like, he's kind of like that. Hani's behind the judges, like screaming his brains out, going crazy. They had to sit him down and calm him down. And I really didn't think, I didn't put two and two together at that time. I had no clue what went on. I just thought I, it was another show I got screwed over at. Mm -hmm. But it was so bad. I got off stage and anybody and everybody, coach-wise, magazine-wise, they had to come up to tell me how bad I got screwed over. I had no idea. They said that was a word, one of the worst things we've ever seen. And so mm -hmm. I just wanted to get out of there. And so Hani was like, after that, we, he had an after party that night, him and Jay Cutler. He's like, you're good. We're going to go to USA's in six months and then you'll get your card there and be fine. I didn't even tell Hani what was going on. So he was just puzzled too. So about two weeks after the show, he calls me. He's like, hey, did you get your house raided for, for steroids? And I'm like, no, it wasn't that. It was something else. But yeah, they did. He goes, well, dude, he goes, all the judges knew. Mm. And he goes, of course they're not going to. Because at that time, if you got your pro card, that meant you were going to be in every magazine. Literally, the whole world were going to, was going to know who you were, mm -hmm. especially in the heavyweight, super heavyweight division, mm -hmm. like the big boys. And um, they're not going to put somebody that heard that got their house raided on all the magazines, just turned mm -hmm. pro for the league. And then it comes out a few weeks later, oh, big steroid bust, because that's what they thought it was. They thought mm -hmm. it was, I got raided for steroids. And Hani was like, dude, they all knew. He's like, it's okay. Don't worry. We'll turn pro at, in, at the USA. It's just, and, but at that time, I got in a car wreck during that prep. I got hit from behind and it tore some ligaments in my shoulder. I didn't think it was that bad, but I ended up having to have surgery after that, sh that mm -hmm. show. 
Mm-hmm. Connie's like, you'll be fine. We'll be, you'll be out four months. And so I went, I found the best surgeon I could find. He was a Texas Ranger, Ranger surgeon. Um, and so I went to him, we did an MRI. He's like, okay, your AC joints messed up and your rotator, t- rotator, rotator cuff is torn. We get, we fixed that. But when he's inside doing the surgery, he, um, it didn't show, but my labrum was torn also. So he's used to working on baseball players. When you fix a baseball player's labrum, it kind of ends their career because they can't snap their arm back real fat back like that. I don't need to snap my arm back like that. So he told me where the labrum tear was at. He doesn't think it will give me any problems or cause any pain. I do all the rehab, go through all of it, and it does. I came and I came and press a ten pound dumbbell after four months of rehab. I was like, dude, you, why did you not fix that? I'm like, was so upset. So we had to go right back in, fix it again. And then that put me out of upper body training for a full two years. Wow. Like, so that was at the time that everything was going like this. Mm -hmm. And then it just went right down like that. And then, you know, my mom at the time, she's like, I think this is like a blessing in disguise because, you know, when I made it to the next level, of course, you have to push it to, you know, at the next level. Mm -hmm. So push it, I mean, by, you know, chemical wise that uh, in, in the sport. So, you know, she thinks like that saved me and saved my health because those years I set out, I was like, okay, I enjoy not prepping and not dieting. I missed out a lot of fun stuff. I don't have to worry about eating every two hours, going to the gym constantly, going, doing this. And so I was going to go back to it if I healed, but I never thought I was going to heal because it was taking such a long mm-hmm. time. But, and so finally I was getting better. And then that's when we find out my mom has cancer, breast cancer. She got misdiagnosed. They said it was stage one. It was actually stage four. Mm-hmm. So I quit training all my clients at that time. I moved back pretty much. I kept my apartment out in Dallas, moved back to Arlington. And just spent the last time, just a lot, my mom's last days with her, which was about a year. And so I didn't care about anything else. She eventually passed away. And then I just needed something to keep my mind busy. So I was like, I'm going to compete. It was in 2014. This is when the money left already, but I was just coming back to do it just to see if I could do it. Because after my shoulder surgeries and all that, um, I wasn't at hundred percent, my shoulder still. But I was like, I'm just going to see if I can do this still and um, do it for fun. I'm not, I don't have any expectations at all. I'm just doing it for fun. So I, did, I competed three times that year. And I actually got bigger than ever. I mean, the muscle came back so quick because I got really small. I mean, not working out at all for two years straight. Muscle memory. Yeah, I mean, it came back extremely fast. And then so I won the Cali show that year. And then I went on to nationals again as a favorite to win the heavies. Mm-hmm. And then I was the only person they did a road to the nationals. They, it's a, like a lifestyle video. Mm-hmm. Plus they follow you in the gym and all that. But my weight just kept getting big. I just kept getting bigger and bigger. And so Dave was just like, uh, Dave, I went back to Dave to help me for my last show. And he was just like, just roll with it, dude. If you try to like burn the muscle, I don't think your body's going to look right. It's just mm-hmm. your body's trying to grow. You're a little older now. And so I ended up, you know, weighing way over how to compete in the super heavies at that show. And when they're promoting you to go to the heavies to win, that's where they project you to go. I went to the super heavies. Um, I told our state chairman at that time, I didn't make, he's like, he's like, you didn't make weight. I'm like, no, dude, I'm like 15 pounds over. It's like not even close. There was no way I could make weight. It's muscle. And I did that nationals. I, I think I placed like, I can't even remember. And, um, that was my last show. Um, and after that, I was, I mean, everything was different. There was no money. There was no shoots to do. There were still shoots to do. Mm -hmm. And the photographers would give you their, your pictures, but they're like, I don't know if you want to shoot with me. I'm like, why not? They're like, we don't pay anymore. I'm like, well, Mm -hmm. what do you mean you don't pay anymore? They're like, we, our sites don't do well. Everything's that different. And so that was the last year. And that's when I retired. And I had to hear it constantly. Why do you retire? Like, retire all the time and people don't understand everything combined it was just there it made no sense to keep competing for no reason Mm -hmm. so you went on to become a judge which I'm real interested in um as far as like a lay person like me I'm kind of new to like 
learning about the sport. I see the bodybuilders on stage. They all look great. Everybody's got muscles. I understand there's different criteria. So explain as a judge, what are you judging? So everybody gets into judging for different reasons. Obviously, some to do <laughs> corrupt, corrupt stuff. Some people Let's just put them be. aside. Let's go with the judges that are really there to judge. So, yeah, so I got into it because I wanted to see behind the scenes stuff like, you know, what happens when you judge. So it, they made it difficult for me to be a judge just because of my age, because I was going to be the one of the youngest, I, not one. I was going to be the youngest judge in Texas ever at that time. So they made it hard. I had to test judge shows and all that. Several, and eventually I became a judge. So um, basically... I kind of saw like how hard it is to judge, like especially the classes like bikini and men's physique, basically where they're not posing. They're just kind of standing there. And especially bikini, it could becomes very subjective. You've got, you know, a, a brunette girl or, or uh, you know, uh, a blonde girl looking the same. As a guy, you're going to pick what you're probably attracted to more just naturally you think looks better. So it was very hard to judge bikini because they kind of all look the same at that level. Um, and I learned a lot about the judging and then I kind of understood, yeah, how people get looked over because you just have to do it so fast up and down, up and down, up and down. The bodybuilding was really cut and dry, but like I said, the other classes and that's when men's physique was really growing and there was tons of competitors on stage. And um, I got to learn a lot and I also got to learn some corrupt stuff I dealt with too. Like uh, I was judging a show and uh, Lee Thompson, he was a, the chairman then. He's, he's not anymore, but um, it was the overall, I, I believe it was the bikini overall. And this happened twice actually at another show too. But so we got, we all got this one girl winning. She's a clear winner. He comes by, he's like, hey, change the score sheets to this girl. And I'm like, I was kind of confused. I'm like, no, I've got her winning. He's like, no, put her winning. And I'm like, he's like, it's chairman's choice. And I'm like, okay. And then it didn't matter anyways. They, the head judge was still going to announce who was who. They just wanted to just have the scorecards with the right scores. And I refused to do it. So I was the only one out of the group that didn't listen. But I didn't care. I'm like, okay, what am I going to get fired as a judge? Oh, no. What's, you know, like it's, it was just something extra I was doing to learn about. It's not like you get paid a lot or anything at all. You get paid hardly anything. And so I did that. And then that caused a big uproar when I got into it with the vice state chairman and all that. And I was just trying to, since all, I dealt with so much corrupt stuff while I was competing, I wanted to bring out that corrupt stuff that was happening when people work so hard, you know, and put their bodies through all that just to, you know, the right person should win. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of learned through that. And then, um, you know, I did it heavily for a while. It would take up your whole weekend. And so eventually when my daughter was born, I, I chilled out on it because I'd rather spend time with my daughter than go to a bodybuilding show all weekend mm -hmm. and judge. But I learned a lot doing it. And, um, you know, you would deal with people like, you know, after the shows, a lot of the bikini girls would come up to you and talk and they're like, hey, what do I need to do to get better? You kind of tell them and they would kind of solicit you at that point to try mm -hmm. to like kind of sell their body to you thinking they would get a better placing. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm like, no, no, I'm not in for that. That doesn't work with me and whatever. But um, it's just there it's still they still got a long way to go to clean stuff up i mean the washington post i mean they contacted me for a different type of article that ran um and i'm not even a fan of the washington post but i talked to a lady for a while it was, it was basically about coaches that have killed their clients tell them to do really reckless stuff we spoke for about an hour and a half one day um i was kind of we were going over certain coaches that did this. And then I didn't know they were going to let an, um, another article. I didn't know they were working on another article. So when I got to I'm talking with her, like two weeks later, another article was let out about exposing the IFBB for girls that's basically were pressured, solicited into doing 
sexual acts or for or certain photo shoots for certain places. So that all these women came forward at one time. And this just this just ran, I mean, like a month or two ago. It's all recent. Mm -hmm. And so basically the a guy that used to work with the IFBB is with the IFBB Pro League, which is a totally different thing. I think he kind of started all that mess just to kind of mess with them. But, you know, it does happen. But, you know, as a, as a like the, Jim Mannion, the Mannions, you got Jim Mannion, you got a son, J.M. Mannion, then you got Tyler Mannion. They're the owners of the NPC IFBB. Um but you can't control what all these promoters are doing, um, all these head judges are doing. It's so hard to kind of manage all them, all the dirty stuff they do. So that article came out and, you know, we spoke about it on the podcast on RX Muscle with Dave and all that. And like, you're, I'm just thinking like, you know, if my daughter is so passionate about something, let's say she's doing a photo shoot for, you know, like, let's say she's competing. And during that photo shoot, the guy, you know, makes a move on her. She's not comfortable with, but in her mind, she's just thinking, I will do anything to become whatever, whatever it is, the best cheerleader, the best gymnast, best competitor. And so no one held guns to these girls head, but they thought like, if I don't do this, I'm never going to get a pro card and I'm never, and I'm going to be blackballed and all this stuff. So a lot of girls weren't comfortable, but they they kind of still did it. So it's kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I get both sides um, and it, it still has a long way to go to clean up. The guy stuff is really, is not doesn't really go on anymore. The gay guy stuff, but the women, um, it's still a problem. It's still a problem. But you got to understand, you got, you've got women wanting to do certain things to get ahead too, though. So. Right, right. So, okay. With the going back to like the judging criteria, you have the head judge and they can override everybody's scores if the head judge says that guy's number one. Is that how yeah. it works out? Now, do the competitors ever get to get any feedback? Do they get to see the written scores during pre judging, after judging, or they don't get any of that? Yeah. So, first, we would, we would hang around after the shows. And the competitors could come up to us personally and ask us, what do we need to work on? Of course, we don't remember what they looked like on stage, but we would be Why like, wouldn't they what? give them a written something? Too much liability? Were they afraid of lawsuits? Is there a reason why they can't give out like a printed, not a report card, but you know what I mean, like that? Well, well we start, they started doing that. So at first it became too many competitors and you couldn't remember who was who on stage. So then they made it a rule, like, if you compete and you want to know what you need to work on, e email one of the judges, send them your competition pictures, and they're supposed to respond to you what, with what you need to work on. So as a judge, people would email me, and I would email them back, hey, yeah, bring your shoulders up a little bit, or whatever they needed to work on. So that ha that's how it works now. But the thing is, a lot of time the judges give you answers that are just BS, just to give you an answer. Maybe they don't want to tell you you know, you have no chance ever of doing well. You know what I mean? Maybe they want to want to hurt your feelings or so a lot of times, you know, if you have a good coach, they know what you need to work on. The judge's opinions are just kind of like, you know, maybe that judge will, will remember you the next show and keep a better eye on you, but that's how it kind of goes now. So you would, you would write in, you would email the judge now and then they would, you know, show, you know, tell you what you needed to work on. Okay. So when they're judging, I know it's conditioning, symmetry. Um, what else are they looking at? Size? It's different for different classes. We, you know, there's different criteria for different classes. But yeah, like bodybuilding, it's size, symmetry, hardness, balance. You know, you don't want to have any body parts like way overwhelming than other, other body parts, conditioning. Mm -hmm. And so you have criteria for each classes, like men's physique, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, we don't even, they tell us not to even judge the legs. They're in, they're in board shorts anyways, but they're like, look at, don't even look at the calves, looked at the waist up. Yeah. I don't agree with, I don't like that class really. I think they should have at least like high cut shorts or something like that to judge yeah. the body on. But, and then they made classic physique a few years ago. And then they just came out with wellness. So mm -hmm. it's like, they're making a class 
So literally everybody could compete. Everybody can have a class they could go to and compete. Do I agree with that? It's kind of hard because when I started, it was male bodybuilding, female bodybuilding, and then fitness. And those fitness girls, I have so much respect for because they not only had a diet, diet down to look crazy, they had to tumble and flip and do all this stuff. And their injuries, you know, you get injured yeah. easily when your joints are all dried out and stuff like that. Yeah. And so that's what I was used to. And so when they started adding all these new classes that were just not as um, on this hardcore, it took a lot of money away from the bodybuilding too, because mm -hmm. let's say, you know, they're paying uh, a, like three different bodybuilders a couple hundred thousand dollars a year for the contract just to be sponsored. Mm -hmm. Then all these bikini girls, men's physique guys came in and they're excited just to be a part of it, right? That they're just even part of something. Um, so they were willing to do everything for free. So basically the companies were like, why would we pay? Why are we still, why are we paying these bodybuilders, you know, all this money when we could get 20 men's physique guys to do it for free? We can give them a jug of protein and they're happy with just getting exposure. And that's, so that's what took, that's why a lot of the bodybuilders didn't like the men's physique guys, because what they should have done, they should have stood their ground and like, no, we need to be paid to, we need to do that. But all the guys, they just wanted to be seen. They got in, they get into it for different reasons, probably than we did just to be kind of the social media era. I got into it because I just wanted to bodybuild. There was no only rewards then was being in the magazines, which, you know, show that you were legit. Now anybody can you know, come up with a social media account and trick a bunch of people that there's someone they're not and then be making money in that way. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I, my understanding is that it's the men that are supporting the women as far as like the money, the crowd that comes to the show yeah. um, that, you know, especially the open, because that's what everybody wants to see the, the biggest. Um, what is your thoughts on that? Is, is the open the best? Yeah, I mean, if you took the open out, the, the Olympia, no one would hardly show up. People aren't, I mean, even though the people in classic physique. Or well, if you take team, away Chris they, Bumstead, would classic physique even be popular? Um, I think it still would because you would have another person that would step in his footsteps. Mm -hmm. The thing with Chris Bumstead, everybody thinks he's just some, um, um, it, it does he have a good physique? Yes, he has a great physique. But is it is it that great? Not really, because it's 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 I don't know how to put it. I'm trying to put it a nice way. Um he wouldn't win an open for sure. No, no, no. I mean he would get last place in open, but yeah. you know, in bodybuilding, you used to have but the bodybuilders I'm not a fan of now, anyways, either because of the direction it went. They all have these big descended stomachs. Um, they're awarding people with, they're just awarding different things than they used to. What the bodybuilding I fell in love with is not the bodybuilding of today. The, the, the drugs are way out of control. People are dying left and right. These past two years, we had so many deaths in bodybuilding. And just because you've got these other coaches out here giving this you know insane advice out for these guys to take all this stuff so there's a new norm, like, of course, we have to take stuff to compete, but now there's a new norm to take stuff, and it's way more than the guys were taking before, and of course, science has got better, you know, new drugs have come out, so you would think that the physiques would get better, mm -hmm. but they got worse because the abuse of all these drugs are making the physiques look worse because, like, when I got into it, I had a 10-year plan, like, okay, in 10 years, I want to be this size. Now the guys get into it and they're like, I want to get as big as possible, as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. But the physiques look differently. Like you'll notice like all the guys at the Olympia stage, none of them have one striation in their shoulder. When you diet down, you're shredded, your shoulders should be shredded, lines everywhere, lines everywhere here. But they're, they're getting big too fast, too quick. And the muscles don't have the same look, like a fibrous, pretty look. Their waists get thick a lot faster just because they're putting on so much size at, at one time. And I think classic has become a lot more popular for a lot of young guys to get into because it's more, you know, it's more ideal to get into. Like, you're like, yeah, I can get that big eventually. You look at these open guys 
and it's impossible, pretty much impossible to get that big. And then most of them don't even look good. Like, mm -hmm. why would you even want to look like, I mean, looking at the open stage today, I mean, I wouldn't want to look like any of those guys. Derek Lunsford, great physique. I thought he had a very pretty physique. I see a bright future for him. A couple mm -hmm. other guys like Andrew Jack, Samson, they look great. But besides that, I wouldn't want to look like any of those guys. They mm -hmm. look like uh, experiment gone wrong. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, yeah, I saw an interview with Arnold Schwarzenegger right after the Olympia and he said that bigger is not better. Better is better. And you know, a big part of it is to blame is the judges because when I was competing, oh, you look great. Everything looks great. Just get bigger. Just get bigger. That's what they would keep telling us. So what do we do? We kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And at a certain point, I was big enough. I was like, if I push it anymore, this is going to start distorting my physique, my weight, because everything grows. Your waist is, a, I mean, your, your abs and waist is muscle too. They're, it's going to get thicker and wider. And that's not symmetrical or aesthetic at all. And it doesn't mm -hmm. look good. So I wish they never made the classic division. I just wish they, mm -hmm. the bodybuilding went in a different direction where it still had that classic look. Like, you know, in the nineties or even before that, mm -hmm. like, I wish that's what happened. So are we at a but, point of no return that open is just going to continue to push the chemical envelope and, and see where it goes. Well, you know, you got some promising new guys, like I said, like Andrew Jackson, Samson, and they're a little taller guys too, for body, but they're like six, one, six, two. Mm -hmm. They, uh, um, they need to bring up some body parts and come in more condition, but if they do, they, they have those like pretty lines of like a Flex Wheeler or Kevin Lavroni. And so if those guys next Olympia placed in the top, that gives hope for bodybuilding. Like, okay, now we got a new example of a Mr. Olympia to look like, to kind of, you know, represent because you got all the guys out there and I, I still work with some of the pros, but I refuse to run my client's physique just so they can place better by their judging criteria, by getting them bigger everywhere else, but their waist is getting bigger. I, I just don't agree with that. I'm like, for what? You know, mm -hmm. it's especially when they're not making money either. I mean, these guys are living like contract in paycheck to paycheck. And I mean, one guy they did an interview with, we even interviewed him on Dave's site. He was crying because he lost his contract and he didn't even know how he was going to pay for his apartment. Wow, wow. And this is a guy that's top 20 in the world. That shouldn't happen in a professional sport, but. Yeah. So let's, let's touch on the coaching aspect of it. I know you're a prep coach and what are your thoughts on uh, what makes a good quality coach? If somebody's looking to hire one. Um, you know, experience, of course, like, you know, they're past clients. If you're a good coach, you're going to have a lot of clients you worked with and, you know, I would say the transformation. It's funny because, you know, when I was coaching, I would never get just somebody that looked amazing that would come to me because I was known as, you know, uh, great at transforming bodies. I could get a guy that, you know, may, you know, look terrible and maybe just wanted to get in shape. And then the next year we're winning competitions. So, and they're like, cause I was like, yeah, we can eventually compete probably. And they're like, what do you mean compete? I can never win a show. I'm like, yeah, we get you there. And then they're eventually winning a show where you got a lot of other coaches, you know, they build up their name because they will be, they'll only prep somebody if they already look amazing. Mm -hmm. So what they, a couple coaches would do would, they would be going to these guys, to these pros and saying, Hey, I will prep you for free. You even got one coach that was at one point cooking all this clients meals for free. His wife was doing it. He was having them come live with them. He was buying their drugs for them, their bodybuilding drugs and everything, just so he could build up his name with the top client. So then he had all these amateurs hiring him and making his money that way. I, whatever, that's his game to get where he was at. I don't agree with that. And even just like Hottie, no, Hottie's never had a guy that he took from here to here. It's always been like from here to here, mm -hmm. like from great to just better. So that's where Hani kind of gets a lot of like a flack. Like you never created a champion. They were already in the making mm -hmm. and probably any coach, any good coach could have got them there. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, ex experience. Yeah, like these guys, I see a lot of younger guys hiring coaches their own age. First of all, they don't have the experience. You can read as much as you want to possibly like I did, but nothing's going to teach you better than experience because what looks good on paper, like, okay, um, I've ate this many calories. I burned this many calories. So this is how my body, should, it doesn't, well, it doesn't work that way. What looks good on paper doesn't work the way in the body because everybody's genetics are so differently. People process fats, carbs, proteins differently. They People process react chemicals different the, differently. Chemicals totally differently. So yeah. you got these guys that are selling themselves on like, oh, being overly scientific and trying to get clients that way to confuse somebody so much where a lot of it's just, you just have the niche for it. Just like I kind of compare it to magis a, a musician where you can kind of give someone 10 people a guitar and you could give nine of them lessons and one of them not. And that one person could just be, just have the niche to become a great musician just by being born with that natural ear to hear music or whatever it may be. So definitely their transformations, make sure they actually are, have clients. A lot of these coaches, yeah. They talk about, you know, how great they are and all that. And they never post any pictures of clients. Like, where are, where are all your clients? Mm -hmm. You know, I've had so many, you know, thousands of clients over the years. But we only started keeping up with pictures when it became easy, like when you had a camera phone. So mm -hmm. all these great people I had before, I don't even have pictures of them. But yeah. so someone that definitely has a lot of pictures of before and afters, transformations. Um someone that's not too like salesman like like if you're a good coach you're going to be busy yeah i'm not going to anybody and telling them hey let me prep you. hey let me prep you. hey let me prep you or that whole oh i'm prepping people this year i only have two more spots available like that whole deal like you, you have tons going, of spots going available. and gone be sure you, yeah, don't, you have don't have any business. 24 hours <laughs> yeah like you don't have any business and so yeah too many people are coaching people that have no clue. I mean, I've had coaches come to me wanting to pay me to learn how to be a coach and they're already coaching people. I'm like, mm -hmm. how can you tell someone to, what to do when you don't even know the basics in and ins and outs of, yeah. of basic nutrition? It's, so it's, it's so unregulated, right? There's not like a degree for bodybuilding coach or, you know, to, like, I think it's still kind of the wild, wild west out there and you have to be real diligent on who you're going to hire and do your background checks on them and that type of thing. And then also, you know, getting sick, like the article, the Washington post ran about the deaths and bodybuilding. You know, you've got these coaches, the most stuff, the most dangerous thing in bodybuilding that caused the most death is diuretics, which is water pills. Mm -hmm. because you're already dehydrated and then you're taking something that makes you more dehydrated shuts the kidneys down cause a heart attack and one of them you know he had about nine girls that he killed in the past few years like they would either die like the day before the show or the day after because oh that's God. when he was giving them crazy amounts of diuretics so was he held accountable those. how though i don't know i mean is, is that a, a topic of discussion to hold some of these coaches accountable for what they are prescribing and so forth? I mean, we're not, we're not doctors. So it's like, you can't go after us legally. Um, the Washington Post has showed even text in between the clients and coach. Okay. So, Cause it's even, consent. It's consensual. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you, we're kind of like recommending. So it, it got to a point now where I don't even want to work with the top pros because they're, it's just such like a chemical warfare. It's not even about like, Hey, hardcore training, nutrition, everybody just cares about drugs. Now I guess a consultation with a young 20 year old. The first question is what kind of cycle do you think we can do? I'm like, dude, you, you don't even have a base to start it. So it's almost like irritating. And I work with so many, so, so much more normal clients now that just want to stay in shape. Yeah, because Wait. I wouldn't be okay with telling somebody to do something that's going to harm themselves. And yeah, these guys today are just crazy. They'll take anything and everything just to, you know, they're willing to kill themselves to get to the top. Yeah, it, it is crazy. We always hear about like 
the, you know, the increasing rates of drug addiction and sudden deaths and all this type of stuff with the younger group, like, yeah, it, it is pretty nuts. Yeah. Um, so we're kind of getting here toward the end. Do you have any like final thoughts you would like to give about, you know, pro bodybuilding, either in the judging and the coaching or just becoming one that you would like to share with the audience? You know, this discussion of, you know, podcasts all the time, the, the industry all the time. What's the answer to all this? The deaths, the people getting sick, you know, bodybuilding has always been a dangerous tie. Unfortunately, in all sports, there's performance enhancing drugs, obviously, but their goal is to not look super muscular. We get judged on how we look. So, of course, people are going to be like, oh, they're they take so much drugs and then you got the same person watching a favorite football team thinking, think, thinking football players are natural. It's just yeah. like, <laughs> come on. Every elite professional athlete is probably dabbled in something. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, so bodybuilding, it's at a place right now where it needs to be, um, you know, it's never good. They've tried. I mean, it used to be on ESPN years ago. They've tried to make all these other classes to make it more popular to the general public which it has, but that doesn't bring much more money in. It brings money in for the people at the very top to own the, that own it, and then the promoters because they have more people competing, but the athlete itself, there's really nothing in it for them. So I get so many consults today, and uh, I turn, you know, I could take someone's money and say, yeah, we'll compete and do this, but I'm honest with them. I'm like, listen, you might have a dream to become a bodybuilder and a pro, and I'm like, I'm like, why? And I'll ask them, why do you want to become a top pro bodybuilder? They really don't even know. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, I'm like, do you know you won't make any money, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, really? I'm like, no, from what are you going to make money from? So I think a lot of people don't realize. And people was like, oh, you're just so negative all the time. No, I'm a realist. I'm being honest because I don't want to see some kid put everything into bodybuilding when he could go actually have a successful life instead of getting in this you know, toxic industry has become really yeah. toxic to where, you know, now it's like everything's backwards instead of the training, the nutrition, the natural supplements coming first, it's the drugs, the drugs, the drugs, then the mm -hmm. training, which they're not, they don't even train anywhere near like we used to. They don't diet like we used to, like they don't suffer. That's why mm -hmm. they're not in as great, good shape. And then they just bypass most of the natural supplements. Now they don't even think there's any point to them mm -hmm. because they're taking all the chemicals and it's just frustrating. And I don't, I don't think there is an answer. I mean, that's what everybody's trying to figure out and debating all the time on podcasts. And it's just kind of like, nobody knows there's not really yeah. an it, answer. It, there's a lot of enabling happening and I'm glad that you come from a very, you know, straight from the hip, very honest. I like your YouTube channel, your Instagram, your TikTok. I highly recommend everybody go check that out because you do speak very forthright, which we need more of because people who are enabling some of this stuff, I mean, that's, that's an enemy. Enablers are enemies and you need to like see the fake, you know, alliances, fake friends, and you know, all those types of things that are kind of happening around there. So um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, like the other day I was being compared to a coach, like you're just jealous of that coach because he has a third place Olympia. I'm like, you have no, at what cost? Yeah, I said, I've got, I don't have anybody on Olympia stage now, but I also don't have any, my client six feet under, which this coach has. And this coach, he, ha I got, I've got a lot of his clients. One of his clients came to me, this will be the last thing I say. One of his clients came to me several months ago, like about six months ago. And I was like, let me see your, um, cycle Matt wrote for you his name's Matt I don't care I mentioned his name before his Nick Walker's coach Matt Jensen I see it I'm like who I'm like how long have you been on this he's like like eight months I'm like come off completely just stay on your regular testosterone replacement and go get blood work ASAP he calls me two days later he's sick he's thrown up he doesn't feel good he have, he's having stomach pains I said, go to the ER. He goes, no, nah, man, I don't want to go to the ER. I go, go to the ER. Something's not right, dude. That cycle you were taking in such for a long period of time, like this guy is not even a competitor. He, he was just a wealthy guy that just wanted to stake Jack. So this coach just took his money, 
gave him crazy cycles. And so I didn't hear from him for a couple of days. So next he calls me, he's in the hospital. So his kidneys are failing. And this guy's young, he's like in his early thirties. And so he ends up being in the hospital for about a month. His creatinine levels go down. So they're able to save his kidneys supposedly. But then a couple weeks, months later, about a month and a half later, we're still keeping in contact. He still wants me to coach him, but I said, dude, don't care. Don't worry about that. Just get healthy. So his kidneys started failing again. That So they weren't healed. So luckily he has family in Iraq. So he's there currently right now and he gets his kidney transplant in like three days. Wow. So he's going there and paying $25,000 just to get it, not to wait on any waiting list like we have here. And he's fortunate enough he can afford that and get it done. But it's sad that this guy has to get kidneys because of the result of this guy. And people are praising this guy and saying, oh, you're jealous of them. I'm like, no, I don't have any clients that I've, that I've killed and that are, had multiple health problems. Not, and, and then one of the guy's comments back was, well, it's only been one guy he's killed like out of 200. I'm like, one too many. Only, <laughs> yeah like that's one too many so it's just that kind of stuff I don't even want to deal with the top pros coaching them anymore because they're all wanting to do the same thing to Mm -hmm. get to the you know it's just how it is it's different yes yes well Armand this has been very enlightening thank you for sharing all your stories and you have a very colorful past and have done some amazing things and uh, really enjoyed hearing about them and you know learning from you as far as like judging and coaching so If you guys want to check out his website, I'm going to link it down in the description box. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell to be alerted to when the next video drops. Thanks for watching. Thanks, Armand. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it.